Today is Thursday, right? Time flies. Today, I'd like to talk about hypertension, hepatitis, and cirrhosis. I will share those kind of disease, those kind of things tomorrow. Today, hypertension. In hypertension, blood pressure is very simple. Our heart pushes the blood to the blood vessel, and that blood vessel got pressured. If our heart stops, there's no blood pressure because the blood blood vessel is not pressed, is not pressured. So if the heart pumps really hard, then blood pressure goes up. If the heart pushes just a little bit of blood, then your blood pressure goes down. So according to how hard your heart pushes the blood, it decides your blood pressure. So when you exercise, your heart needs to push a little harder so your blood pressure goes up when you exercise. When you're upset, when you're angry, your heart pushes harder, your blood pressure goes up. Now, the reason why you have high blood pressure because there's a reason why. There's a need. There must be a reason to have high blood pressure. Our body responds to the need. It is same with the cancer cells. There, there must, you know, there must be a reason why these normal cells change into cancer cells. It's not about your luck. There must be a cause and there it must be a result according to the cause so you have to get rid of those cause if you want to have a balanced blood pressure if you don't get rid of those cause and if you want to take your blood pressure down that is nonsense but that's what you receive at the hospital so instead of getting out of, getting rid of those cause, but you just get the depressant, then you won't be able to solve your high blood pressure problems. So sometimes you hear that if you once take those depressant, you know, those medication, then you have to take those medicine until you die. But if you get rid of those cause, then you don't need to take those depressant until you die, until the day you die. <laughs> I don't know why people don't want to think about these cause. You know, many people have their own way of thinking, and they just can't get out of from their thinking. Now, there are four about four reasons to have this kind this hypertension. First, we have a central hypertension. This hypertension You know, you have this hypertension because you know, in our brain there is a controlling center in our brain, there's a controlling, controlling center of high blood pressure, but then it is, you know, damaged. Then you have central hypertension. Now, this hyperten hyperten central hypertension is very rare. So you may forget about the central hypertension. Now, second one, even though everything is normal, but, you know, just because you're just because of your state of mind, you can have hypertension. For example, you don't eat salty, spicy food, but just because you're 
mind, state of mind, you can have hypertension. This we call psychogenic hypertension. You know, you don't also need to worry about this hypertension. Because when you look at these kind of people, you can just tell by their complexion. Their face is always rigid, intense. They always, you know, have this kind of face. Then that person must have a very high blood pressure. Even though he doesn't do anything, he has a very tense, in he lives in tense. You know, he has kind of like resentful mind. When he has this kind of resentful mind, you know, your blood pressure goes up. So this is psychogenic hypertension. You don't need to really worry about this. Now, third one is the elongated hypertension. It means your kidney is not so good. You know, our kidney filters our blood. So to filter really well, you know, uh, a lot of blood should go to the kidney. So if the kidney is broke down, then you cannot, the kidney cannot really work. So the you know the heart pushes a little really hard toward the kidney and that's why you have high blood pressure down there. So this we call elongated hypertension. Now today I'm going to talk about not central hypertension, psychogenic hypertension, nor elongated hypertension, but I want to talk about essential hypertension today. Sounds a little bit difficult. Essential hypertension. Original state. Essential means original state. So essential means even though you have high blood pressure, it is not strange because, you know, this was what it meant to be, so you don't have to worry about this. This we call essential hypertension. So commonly, when we say you have hypertension, usually this is essential hypertension. This is the case. We use this essential hyper, the word you essential hypertension is because we couldn't find the reason. We couldn't find why our blood pressure goes up. Because, you know, our lifestyle, for example, our lifestyle has been the same 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 10 years ago. It has been the same, all the same. But why do I have, you know, hypertension all of a sudden? Ten years ago, I was normal, but then I started to have high blood pressure, and then and my blood pressure never goes down to the normal range. So I had to take depressant. You know, that hypertension is essential hypertension. So it seems like it doesn't have reasons. <coughs> Excuse me. So your lifestyle, your diet, it has been, you know, about the same. 10, 20 years ago, it was about, you know, my blood pressure was okay, but now I have high blood pressure. I don't know why. So this essential hypertension, it is very difficult to find the reason. And then, you know, I look around, you know, I look around, you know, people, I look around, you know, my friends, and then, you know, they usually have this kind of essential hypertension. Now, h blood pressure went up, then there must be a reason. So today, we're going to find the reason, the cause of this essential hypertension. If you find the cause, you will be able to solve your problem. Before, 
that, you know, we want to measure this blood pressure. Now, when you measure your blood pressure, you have two numbers. And sometimes people are confused by the numbers. Some people say the upper numbers and the lower numbers. And they're sometimes confused. What is the upper one and what is the lower one? Now, let's say you have 120 and 20 70. What does that mean? Now, you know, we usually take blood pressure around our arms. Now, when you take, when you take blood pressure, you know, they press down your arm. Why is that? To block your blood vessel, to constrict your blood vessel. And then, you know, they take the air out slowly. So let's say the first time was 200. And then they listen. Now when you are fully, when your blood vessel is fully constricted, they can't hear the sound and then you take the water out slowly and then you hear, you know it, the number goes down 190 180 170 160 140 120 when it's about 120 and then the blood started to get through and then you say oh that person is 120 upper number is 120 so what is 120? What is the case? Yes, that is when the heart pushes the blood. That's what we call systolic pressure. Highest or constricted. So we call it systolic pressure. You know, if our hearts, if our hearts only constricted, then we die. You know, our hearts constricts and our heart dilates. S constricts and dilates. When the heart constricts, you know, blood goes out. When the heart dilates, and then, you know, blood comes in. So, you know, you start to hear this blood gets through your blood vessel, and then 10, 100, 90, 80, 70, and you hear this sound. So when the heart is fully dilated, the sound stops. And that is diastolic pressure. So 120 and 70. So when the heart is dilated, you know, when the heart is constricted, your heart has a lot of blood. So you have really high blood pressure. But when the heart is dilated, your blood pressure goes down because your heart doesn't have a lot of blood. So you know blood, when the heart is constricted, you have a lot of blood in the heart. When it's dilated, then you have little blood inside. So we have two numbers when you take the blood pressure. When it constricts really hard, then you have high blood pressure. When the heart constricts not really harder, then you know your systolic pressure will be low. Now the problem is the um, diastolic pressure. 
Let's think about diastolic pl pressure. The more your heart dilates, the more blood the heart receives the blood. What happens? Come on, everybody, think. Come on, think. Not just listening. Think, think. Okay, think. Why you listen? Please think. That's why I speak very slow. You know, when I, you know, stop, you have to answer, okay? Please listen careful and answer. Listen carefully. People <laughs> tend to hear the answer. They don't want to answer, but then you say it, you know, teacher, you say it, things like that. Now listen again. The heart constricts hard and then blood pressure goes up and then the heart constricts little less then the blood goes out little now if the heart dilates hard more and the blood from the blood vessel gets into the heart a lot so that there is going to be little blood in the blood vessel so the blood pressure will go down so if you have low diastolic pressure it means your heart dilates a lot do you understand do you understand think Okay, please don't say oh when the when the blood when the when the heart dilates the blood pressure will go down. Uh, what about the heart doesn't dilate? What happens? What happens? You know, they just want to memorize. Please think about rationally. Now, when the heart dilates a lot, your diastolic pressure is low. If the di if the heart doesn't dilate, your diastolic pressure will go up. So when the doctors take blood pressure, they are more interested in diastolic pressure. because diastolic pressure shows the state of our heart. Systolic pressure, actually, when you exercise or, you know, when you exercise or when you are upset, you know, it goes up. So, you know, that's very natural. But dilation has a lot of meaning. Now, let's say the heart dilates really well. What's the difference between, you know, your heart dilates well and your heart cannot dilate well? What does that mean? Your heart dilates really well. What does that mean? Yes, it means your heart, the muscle, your heart muscle is very flexible, soft. If your muscle is soft, flexible, Now, if your muscles are all tangled up, you know, if you bend about this, you will say, ah, painful, painful, painful. But if you're flexible, you know, you goes down and you goes down and you goes down. You bend down a long way. Flexible. When the muscles of heart is flexible, then your diastolic pressure doesn't go up. Now, diastolic pressure 
the normal range, normal range of diast diastolic pressure is about 70 or 80. Sometimes you go 90, 96, and 100. Sometimes you can reach 105 or 110. If your diastolic pressure is more than 100, then you know doctors would say, oh, this person should be very careful. Even though your systolic pressure is high, but then diastolic pressure is in normal range, then the doctors say, it's going to be okay. It means what? It means your heart is quite flexible. Your muscle, your muscle of the heart is quite flexible, so, the, so they don't really worry. But then if your diastolic pressure is about like one, 100 or 105, then doctors say, oh, be careful. Why? Because their heart's flexibility is quite low. It means your heart is quite hardened. What does that mean? Your heart can be hardened. What does that mean? Your heart is hardened. Well, I, you know, I was thinking, how can our body is hardened? You know, our body is quite soft, right? Our skin, muscles, they're all very soft. Now, I say heart is hardened. What does that mean? Yes. It means it's not flexible. Now, let's think about this. Okay, You feel very rigid. Now, let's think about this. Now, look. Now, if you're not flexible, let's say if I'm not flexible, then I will say, you know, I will scream. But if you're flexible, you're not, you don't feel pain. Now, if you say it's hardened, then you have pain. You know, you know, I'm quite okay. I'm over 60, okay, and I'm, I, f I think I'm quite okay with my flexibility. I'm quite flexible. If you're flexible, you're not tired. You know, think about this. You know, I always talk, just talk. You know, I talk during the lecture, but after, I still talk at the table. And then in the evening, I talk. Of course, I take a walk with you. While I, I exercise, I talk. And I always use the stairs, you know, but I'm not tired. I'm very flexible, so I'm not tired. You know, when I was young, oh, oh I feel pain. You know, I have pins and needles in my legs and, you know, every muscle and nerve aches, you know, you know, things like that. I feel cold. Um, give me a massage, you know, things like that. But me, I don't say these kind of things these days because every part of my body is very flexible. I practice, you know, stretching. Well, you do in the morning only, but I do all the time. You know, before I start my lecture, at the back of the stage, I always stretch. I practice. <sighs> you know, I'm very flexible. You know, I can do these kind of things. I'm fine, you know. I, I, I'm just fine. I'm fine. Isn't it wonderful? If you live day by day like this way, you can have this flexibility. And you say, oh, I'm very embarrassed, you know, I'm timid, I'm shy. If you don't do this, you know, you accelerate aging process. Now, smile, laugh, exercise, whatever you want to do.
You should live happily, you know. Now, what's the difference between flexible and rigid? Well, some people, some people will feel pain, you know, feel the pain when they exercise, when they stretch their body. You know, if you have pain, if you have pain, it means if your body, you know, feels painful, it means your body is not provided something what it is needed. Your body needs something, but then it's not provided. What is that? That is oxygen. You know, oxygen is very important. You know, if we don't breathe for five minutes, we die. If the oxygen is not provided, it's not provided, then our body, you know, gives a signal to breathe the ex oxygen. So if you are in somewhere there's um, no not enough oxygen, then you have headache and you're you're and you feel pain in all your joints, you know, things like that. You know, oxygen, lacking oxygen cause you to have pain. And then, uh, of course, moisture, water. Water is the second reason. Now, we, we're supposed to drink four bottles of water. But Koreans, usually, they drink only one and or one and a half bottle of water. So they're, chron chronic they're chronically lack in water. Now you're stressed all the time, so you know you cannot really breathe. But when you go out to the sea, you feel good, and you breathe well, and your oxygen comes into your body, and you see the beautiful ocean, you feel the beauty. So every function in your body gets better. lacking oxygen and lacking water. Now, when you practice New Start, by the way, you can overcome this problem. You know, you have pain because of oxygen, lacking oxygen, in many cases. So, you know, like, when you have pain, when you have cancer, you're painful. When you have when you don't have enough oxygen, you are very painful. And when you're overworked, when you overwork, you are painful. You feel pain also. And when you are stressed and when you are hurt, you know, you feel this pain more. Now, let's say your heart is hardened. What does that mean? It means your heart cannot be dilated because the heart is painful so you know it doesn't really dilate enough so it means your muscles of your heart is not provided enough oxygen it's all of our muscles every way Your blood pressure is directly connected to those lo lacking oxygen. How can you provide oxygen to your muscles? Yes, through blood vessel. You know, we have different types of blood vessel, arota, and the middle arota, and the small, you know, artery. And we have also very fine ar artery. And at the end, we have capillaries. Uh, 
So if your capillaries are spread it out well, very well, then you can, your body can be provided with oxygen. Abundant, oxy abundant oxygen can be provided through those capillaries. You know, in our body, we have about 5,000 cc of blood. Among those 5,000 cc volume of the blood, do you know how much blood, volume of the blood is in your capillaries? Eight, more than 80 percent. So uh, about 4,000 cc, more than 4,000 cc volume of the blood is in your capillaries. You know, we have highway and local highway and um, those road. Of course, highway is very important. And we have a lot of highway. But you know, even though highway is super highway is important, do you know where do those cars are parked? Yes, near our house or a parking lot in town. You know, because in town we have post office and market and pizza house and, you know, many shopping centers. But then super highway, they don't have these kind of stores. Well, yes, we have resting area in Korea on super highway. This is very Koreanistic. It means Koreans love snacking on the highway. If they're, you know, hungry, if they're bored on the highway, they, you know, they stop. They stop at the those resting area on the highway and they, you know, snack. You know, they. You know, they buy those kind of, you know, snacks. But the Americans, their highway, they have nothing on their highway. You know, they don't have that kind of resting area like we do in Korea. They can only stop by and, you know, they can go to the bathroom or something, but not like our snacking place. Anyways, we can have our lives in town, and that's why a lot of cars are in town. Highway is just a way of traveling. Our roads in town, you know, we use these local roads a lot. So capillaries are the same way. You know, so those red blood cell, you know, they conveys oxygen to each and every corner of our body and that goes to goes through the capillaries. Now what's the nature? What's the character of the capillaries? According to the need, those capillaries can be stretched out, can be spread it out. So even though you didn't have that capillaries in that part, but if it's necessary, if it's needed, then those capillaries can stretch out. But if it, it if your capillaries feel if it's not needed there, then they shrink. So, you know, capillaries are the are like this. You know, your mitochondria. Remember, you know, if they feel like they are not needed, then the numbers of mitochondria is decreased. So, healthy people, they have very nicely stretched out capillaries. You know, I don't feel pain usually. You know, I take airplane a lot. And many people say, oh, I feel pain. I have pins and noodles in my legs and so forth. They say, oh, my back aches. What does that mean? When, when you say, oh, my back aches, you know, some people, you know, 
act like this, I my back aches. What does that mean? Uh, it means muscles. Okay, you have your spine in the middle of your back. Now on sides, you know there are muscles. Now these muscles started from where and ends where. Now these muscles you touch now right now. Where does this muscle start? Yeah. These muscles are stuck to your bones. Now, which bone to which bone? Now, you, you have your skull there. So these muscles are start from the skull, and then it goes down to your, yes, pelvis. Goes down to your pelvis. Now, to protect what? Yes, to protect your spine, spinal cord. These muscles are there. Not your, you know, your skull. Your skull and your pelvis are connected to uh, by these spinal cord. So if you have no muscles, you know, in between, you know, people will act like that. People will behave like, you know, a little strange. So you know, these two muscles should support the spinal cord. To straighten up, you know that's you know that's our back muscle. That's our back muscle. You know, I opened up my homepage today, and some people asked me this question, and that person asked me, "Oh, don't you feel like you're missing something? You're not eating meat. You're not eating meat." And that person didn't use um, his own name, but he used very strange nickname, and he asked me a very strange question. You know, last year, this person asked me a very strange question, and this year, again, he's asking me a very strange question. Well, I didn't answer yet, but I'm going to answer him. Well, he said, he said, uh, don't you feel don't you feel sorry about not eating meat then I'm gonna say don't you feel sorry about not knowing the spark now you know you have back muscles you know you have two both sides okay your back muscles are like on the both sides now, two pillars of muscles are not enough, so you need four pillars of muscles, right? So, outer part, outside of your muscles, and the inside of your muscles, okay? You have four pillars, let's say four pillars of muscles, outside and inside, so four of them. On each side, two, so all four. Now, when you say your back aches, it means not about your bone. It uh, it's about your muscle. It means those muscles are not provide enough oxygen. So if you if you're on the airplane, on the same position, then those four pillars of muscles are all intense. But then their capillaries are not that stre stretched out. So if you keep sitting in one position, then, you know, especially on the airplane, okay, you know, you don't have enough oxygen there already. So, you know, those four pillars of muscles are not providing enough oxygen. So you say, oh, painful. But when you lie down, actually, you don't really feel painful because those four pillars of muscles don't need to be intense then and you can also provide some oxygen then you know you don't have pain anymore so if your capillaries are spread it out and stretched out and it has enough oxygen then you have no pain Mm -hmm. 
I said capillaries have more than 80% of your blood. Now, if your capillaries are well stretched out or so your blood pressure is influenced by how well your capillaries are stretched out or not. Now, let's say So let's say you have traffic jam, okay, in town. And a lot of cars will go on the highway. Let's say if your capillaries are shrinked, then you have a lot of blood in your arata or artery. Then you have high blood pressure. Now, essential hypertension is very related is very much related to the state of capillaries. Now let me explain why your blood pressure goes up. Remember, please, stretching is very important. If you don't practice stretching, your capillaries will be shrinked. So if you don't exercise, if you don't stretch, you know, you will be disadvantaged. The, the more you get older, you, you know, you will miss a lot of things. You know, even though you stretch just a little, you have pain. It means your capillaries are, your capillaries or strength. So whatever you do, you know, you, you become very careful when you are not flexible. So every morning you do, you know, stretching. It's not about new start. But if you're a living creature, if you're a human being, if you're, you know, if you're a living creature, then you know that you have to practice stretching. You know, animals don't listen to my lecture. Even though they don't listen to my lecture, they do stretch their body. So God programmed that instinct in their genes. So dogs and cats, after their nap, they stretch. They stretch. I told you, birds do that too. So how much important it is. How important it is. But then, you know, Koreans, you know, because we are so timid or we are so introverted, we don't practice this stretching. Now, please remember, revive your stretching instinct in your genes. Everybody needs to practice stretching. You know, Americans, they do it all the time. So even though they're talking, you know, they can stretch out. If they feel like they want to stretch their body, they do it. But you know, in Korea, if you do it while you're talking to someone, then you feel very bad because that person, you know, laughs at you or looks down upon you, things like that, misunderstanding. But, you know, if you understand the importance of stretching, you know, then you understand their behavior. Remember, stretching, capillaries, all directly connected to your hypertension. Now, normal high blood pressure, normal arrange, normal arrangement is 120, your systolic pressure, and then 70, diastolic pressure. Let's say this is your normal arrange arrangement of your blood pressure. Now let's test this. You know, I slept, 
I took a nice nap, and after that, I took the blood pressure, and that was 120 and 70. And one hour later, My blood pressure has been changed, 142 to 60. Now, if you look at the blood pressure, the numbers, you can tell what I did. Now, see, systolic pressure went up. Hmm, must be, there must be some kind of exercise or very active behavior. You know, when you're upset, of course, systolic pressure goes up. When you exercise, goes up. Systolic pressure goes up. But you know, when you look at this diastolic pressure, you see the diastolic pressure went down. So it means I wasn't upset or angry, but then I was exercising. You know, when you exercise, the heart is very flexible, pushes up and dilates well. Now next today, so the result of this second number was because of exercise. And the next day, it was 142 systolic and then diastolic 86. What does that mean? Now, my heart is quite intense. My heart cannot dilate well. So what did I do? So I got a very strange call right after I got up. And then for one hour, I was thinking, why these kind of things happen? You know, things like that. Then, you know, your systolic pressure goes up, of course. But, you know, when you're upset, when you're angry, ah, oh, how can you do this kind of things? Is that all? Then your heart, you know, cannot really dilate well. So when your mind is rigid, then your heart becomes also rigid. So, you know, you have to be relaxed so that your heart can be also relaxed. So when you're intense, your hands and feet, they become very cold. Why? Because your capillaries shrink. Capillaries are shrink. But when you're relaxed, you know, you sing, then your capillaries opened up and then spreads out, you know, every corner in your body. And then, of course, the oxygen is provided very well. You know, our hearts and our minds are connected. Our minds and our body are also connected. You know, there are some reasons that we don't think they're the reasons. Now, let's say our capillaries, when the capillaries are shrinked, our heart is hardened and our blood pressure goes up. You know, there is cardio stenocardia, cardia. Stenocardia, you know, heart attack. Then you have, you know, your heart, you feel very painful. Your heart feels very painful. You know, that's we call heart attack or stenocardia. You know, when you have this stenocardia, you have pain in your uh, heart. Now, what does that mean? You have pain in your heart. It means, you know, your muscles of your heart are not provided oxygen. It's not provided oxygen. Now, why is that? When you have stenocardia, when do you have stenocardia? When you're upset, yes, or when you're shocked. 
when you're upset, when you worry, when you're afraid, when you are nervous, you have stenocardia. When you're shocked, you know, your capillaries get shrunk. When you stretch well, when you practice, when you start well, then you know your stenocardia will go away. You sing, you exercise, and you smile, laugh. Those will all help your capillaries spread out. You know, our lungs, of course, you know, a lot of capillaries are there in your lung. And that's why laughing, smiling is important. You know, when you laugh, that is, you know, exercise. You know, you're, you're, breathing, you're doing breathing exercise. You know, some, so, so some people say, you know, after they have kind of, um, abdominal breath, you know, exercise, they say, you know, they got better and things like that. You know, breathing is very important. Right breathing is very important. Well, you know, these days many people do meditation. Well, actually, that meditation, okay, movement, that meditation is uh, totally based upon, you know, breathing. But, you know, we already learned the spark and this abdominal breathing. You know, I think I have to study more on this breathing, how to breathe well. Because breathing is very important. Now, you fully breathe in. You know, many times we don't think breathing is not important. But, you know, breathing is very important. You know, the these days a lot of people practice hypogastric breathing, you know, abdominal breathing, okay? And they always talk about, you know, kind of spark okay, that they have. But we know the real spark now, okay? So I'm sure you're not going to be confused with their um, spark. By the way, now you fully breathe in. You know, this is abdominal breathing. Of course, we breathe with our, you know, lung, chest area, but to breathe more, okay, we need to have abdominal breathing. And when we breathe out, So when we practice abdominal breathing, we breathe in deeply and we breathe out, you know, we took we take all the well the air, all the air out of our lungs. Okay. Now look. We breathe out up until we couldn't even get something out. <laughs> Did you count? At least uh, three seconds, you need to breathe out. You need to practice. So you breathe in fully, okay, all to spread out in our lung. And then you also take all those air out from your lung. Up until that moment, you have to practice this. If you breathe out, 
that much that you want to breathe in, then you really want to breathe in again. Now you go to the end, and then, and then you breathe in again. Slowly. And then up until you fill in, you breathe in. And then you breathe out. Slowly. You need to practice these kind of things. Because usually we don't really have nice abdominal breathing. But if you can practice these, your capillaries will spread out really well. And it will convey oxygen all corner of our body. Now from tonight, from tonight, we'll practice. You know, I myself have practiced and I think it's really good. Of course, you know, if we don't breathe, we die. Yeah, if we don't breathe, we die then you know how important it is to breathe. And you will know how important it is. You have to realize how thankful we can be because we can breathe in the air. You know, we don't think. We are not thankful for what we have. We think they're just, you know, we think that is so natural. For example, air or water, because they are everywhere. If we think we, we think it is just, you know, has to be. We don't even think about those things. It's like the same way with our breathing, the way of breathing. Even for five minutes, okay? Even if it is going to be only for five minutes, practice these abdominal breathing. Right. And then if you're familiar with this kind of abdominal breathing, you know, try this all the time. I'm not, I myself are not familiar with abdominal breathing yet. But if you do this, if you practice this, you can meditate actually and you can pray. So actually having a conversation with God is like you're breathing. So, you know, we say prayer is our breath of life. So, you know, it, it matches. You know, because I'm busy, I often forget. So in the morning when you wake up, as you pray, breathe. As you pray, Practice abdominal breathing. Your T cells will love this. Then you know you can calm down. You know. If you practice in the morning fully, If you practice in the morning, if you practice abdominal breathing in the morning, then I'm sure you will be more familiar with your abdominal breathing. And y you can practice like, you know, a more and more. And you will get better and better. Oh, your name. Mm, your name is Manhua. Beautiful name. Um, she wasn't feeling good in the beginning. But then when she practices, practices abdominal breathing, she got a lot better.
So from now on, not hypogastric breathing, you know, but <laughs> with the with a little bit strange uh, oriental spark. But remember the proper environment and the spark from God and then abdominal breathing. Practice those things. Now, capillaries are so important, like I've been saying. So if you breathe well, you know, your blood pressure can be balanced. Now let's talk about more specific reasons for our hypertension. Number one is stressful life. Who has no stress, by the way? You know, I am also stressed. Of course I'm stressed. From who? Yes, from wife. Husbands get stressed from their wives. Because men and women, you know, they're a big different. But then, because man is man and the woman is woman, they feel happy. So, you know, husband and wife, they can give stress, they can release stress. Very interesting relationship. So, when you're happy, when a husband and a wife, husband and a wife is happy, then it's very important for your health. If they're not happy, it is not good. Let's say, oh, my husband loves me so much. You know what, actually, you know, it is very difficult for those busy uh, businessmen to come here, to come here listening to New Start lecture. Now, this lady, this lady's, this lady got a cancer, and her husband came, even though he's a busy businessman. But then he came along with her and listening to New Start lecture with his wife. I'm sure it is a big support and wonderful help. Now this time, and husband got a cancer. And if you look at his wife's facial expression, she's not so sure if he's going to make it or not. You know, but if his wife, you know, is so sure, then her husband will survive. You know, man cannot live alone. You know, the Chinese letters, okay, woman is very important. Wife is important in marriage life. Without wife, without woman, man cannot live alone. Sometimes we ignore, you know, wife's love, but then 95% of our uh, subconscious feels that love. So, you know, man and a uh, woman, husband and wife, they fight sometimes, but that is only in 5% of conscious. But love of love of two people, you know, love of two people works in 95% of subconscious. So, you know, sometimes you say, I want to divorce. That's only in your 5% of conscious. You know, everybody is stressed. Now, when you're stressed, your blood pressure goes up, but it doesn't become your it doesn't become hypertension right away. So, some people misunderstand this. Okay, let's say you have like 120 systolic and 70 diastolic pressure. Now, if your blood pressure doesn't go up, up above 140, your doctors will say, oh, it's fine, don't worry too much, they say. 
and they don't treat you like you're a hypertensive. Yeah, yeah. If your diastolic pressure doesn't go up until 90, then they don't think you're hypertensive. So you know it's quite flexible. Let's say the systolic pressure doesn't go down up until 90, then you are you don't have hypotension, and this diastolic is like 50. So 50 to 90, and 90 to 140. You know it's quite flexible. Because of that, we have confusion. So if if you are 120 and 70, but then you're stressed, then it can be 120 systolic and 75 diastolic, then people, you know, it's like normal. Well, it's okay to be stressed sometimes. They don't think that's the cause of hypertension, they misunderstand and they just ignore. Now, number two, uh, you eat salty and spicy. If you eat salty and spicy, yes, your blood pressure goes up, but then it doesn't, you know, but then we don't call you as a hypertensive. No, you know, you eat very spicy and salty food, and your blood pressure is like 124 and a uh, diastolic 72 and people think like mm, it's okay so they say ah, it's okay to it's okay for me to eat spicy salty food so when you are young you know you're stressed and you eat spicy and salty food but then you know it doesn't really influence your blood pressure sometimes it goes to 120 130 but then it goes down you know later the night it's okay. And also the high fat uh, diet, high fat diet also. You know, after you have high fat diet, your blood pressure goes up. The reason why? Because I showed you those, you know, capillaries, pictures of capillaries. You know, when you have high fat diet, you know, you know your blood is very sticky, so your red blood cell cannot get through those red uh, capillaries. So to get through those capillaries, you know, the heart pushes hard. Anyways, so even though you have high fat diet, you're stressed, you eat spicy and salty food, you know, people don't think you are hypertensive. You know, let's say you went to a party and then you had spicy, salty food and high-fat diet, and on the way back home, you know, you met someone you didn't like, so you argued a little bit. And so, so your blood pressure was 124, 72. And so all those three things are gathered, and then if you take the high bl blood pressure, then it's like 134, you know, things like that, systolic. And they'll think, hmm, even though I had spicy, salty food and high-fat diet and I wasn't even stressed and upset but uh, my blood pressure is still 134, then it's okay. It's fine because I'm, you know, my blood pressure is not over 140. You know, that kind of way of thinking is the problem. Now, when you are young, you know, even though your blood pressure went up, you know, it goes down. Why? Because your capillaries are well, you know, stretched out. When you're young, you move a lot. Even though you don't practice stretching, but then you keep working. You keep, ex you know, you keep, you know, walking around and things. So your capillaries are, you know, quite well, you know, stretched out. But then when you reach to 40s and 50s, you know, You're, you become like manager, you're high positioned, and then you know you drive and you don't you know use the stairs and you know you take the elevator and and then you don't have to take your you know briefcase even your secretary follows you with a briefcase you know things like that and then your capillaries got shrunk you know so for me personally I don't like someone taking my bags you know I take my own bag 
you know, I, you know, I, I don't have enough time to exercise. So I walk more. I try to exercise as much as I can. So at the airport, I have a brisk walking, you know, things like that too. Have better capillaries. Now, as you get older, let's say, you know, you're still stressed and your diet has been changed and you're still upset, but then, I mean, the lifestyle has been the same way, but then your blood pressure went up and it doesn't come down. When you were young, you know, your blood pressure went up and went down, you know, flexibly. But then when you get older, even though your lifestyle hasn't been changed, your blood once your blood pressure goes up, it doesn't come down easily. You know, and it goes up 150 over. And then you, you are hypertensive. And you feel like you have no reason to have hypertension. No. So if you think clearly, those three reasons, like stress and high, per, um, high fat, not enough exercise, of course, you know, those kind of things, and uh, diet, bad diet, plus your capillaries. And you're, you live in a tense life, And you're lacking, of course, oxygen as well. Now, let's say a beautiful woman says, oh, I love you, sing me. But then you're lacking oxygen. Then, you know, you're not interested in a woman. You're, you're very stressed. You know, most people in Korea, chronically, they don't, they're lacking in water. So as soon as you get up, drink one bottle of water your cells will be very happy to be provided water. Then try not to drink water during your meal time. In between your meal time, drink water. So early in the morning, in the morning, before lunch, one more, and then lunch and supper in between, then after, you know, lecture time, just a little more. So seven or eight glasses of water or, you know, seven or eight bottles of water. I mean, three or four bottles of water every day. So when you provide enough water, you will be very relaxed. Breathing, water, you know, enough oxygen, very important. Breathing, very important, okay? Breathing. You know, I I often forget the importance of breathing, even though I realize the importance, but then I don't really practice. So, you know, I should remember. Now, you know why your blood pressure goes up now, right? So if you practice new start, you don't have high fat diet, you don't eat spicy and salty food, and you sing and dance and no stress, and you drink enough water, you breathe fresh air, and you stretch, come on, your blood pressure will go down. There's no way. So wh where, where are you? Yeah, there are, there are some patients here, you know, because they're hypotensives, you know, they took depressant. And then doctors said, now if you once take this depressant, you have to take it until the day you die. And then, you know, patients misunderstand this. Well, doctors said this to you because this depressant will not give you cure. But then patients, in case of patients, they misunderstand that they have to take it until the day they die. You know, if your 
blood pressure goes down, you don't need to take this medicine. You have no reason to take depressant if your blood pressure goes down. But let's say you go back to your own places and you you know, couldn't live, you start life, then your, your blood pressure will go up and you have to take that depressant. But if you practice new start, you don't have to take it and you can reduce it and you can you don't have to take it anymore but some people say you know my doctor said once I start taking this medicine I have to take it until the day I die so they strongly believe it so even though when they come here even though their blood pressure goes down they still take it and then sometimes people pass out and faint because they got a low, a hypotension. You know, we have this kind of person around here. Where is it? Oh, two people. Okay. Two people. Yes. Yeah, two people. Give them a hand. They tried really hard. They practiced real new start. You know, within two, three days, it happened. Amazing, isn't it? So instead of solving these kind of foundational problems, we just take the medicine. If you practice new start, you don't have to take your depressant within four or five days. So if you keep practicing it, you don't have to take your depressant for the rest of your life. You know those depressants, you know, it helps you to urine well, and then your blood pressure will go down. But then you don't worry about, you don't care about the cause. Then later, you know, remember your body felt the need. That's why your blood pressure went up. So if you urine more, then you know your body you know, misunderstand. So, you know, your heart pushes harder. So your blood pressure goes up. And then you take more medicine and then you urine more and then your body misunderstands. Oh, how come, you know, it's happening and then it presses more and then you have higher, hyperten I mean, higher blood pressure. So, you know, the beta blocker, all different kinds of depressant. You know, adrenaline, helps to push up, help your heart to push up. No. So if you take one of those depressant, then they stop to stop your body to produce adrenaline. Then, you know, your body doesn't really push up. Then, you know, it goes down. But then, you know, it's not really working that way. Your body wants to compromise something. Your body wants to make up something. It means you have to take more of the pills and then you will have more side effects from your pills. And so medication cannot give you the answer. So practice new start. The, the way that God prepared for you is the only way for you to overcome your hypertension. So please free from those pills that the doctor says you have to take it until the day you die. Be free from the comment. So practice exercise, stretching. So when you exercise, uh, I have to exercise, I am tired. Don't do that, but exercise actively and gladly. So when you breathe, your, you know, your, your, your blood circulation you know, goes well you know, when you breathe like this, right? So exercise actively and have flexible body and you will have, uh, your blood pressure will go down and your marriage life will be happier.